Welcome to the Why God Why podcast. I am here with our fantastic producer, Nathan Yoder. My name is Peter Engler. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show. Uh, we are here with somebody that I've followed from afar for a while. His name is Micah Fries, uh, and he is uh, from down south, as they like to say. But Micah has been a pastor, a missionary, a professor. Um, you're going to hear more about that. But the question Micah is going to respond to us today when Why God Why is why should Christians have fed friends from other faith traditions? So we respond to the questions you don't feel comfortable in church. You might be wondering, there's a little bit of mixed uh, understanding about having friends who aren't Christians versus having them that are, about evangelizing to them and converting them. Micah, no big deal. You just got to answer all those questions. How does that sound? <laughs> Piece of cake. It'll be no problem. We'll do it in about 20 seconds and be done. <laughs> <laughs> well, Micah, before we go any further, um, we're glad to have you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and uh, the journey of how you are where you are right now? Yeah, so um, I do. I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee, right at the base of the mountains, the Smoky Mountains. I live in a beautiful part of the country, and uh, but I've lived all over the place. I've moved 37 times now uh, in my life. So I've lived East Coast, West Coast, in the Midwest, in the Southeast. I've lived uh, in the Philippines. I've lived in Burkina Faso in West Africa. Mm -hmm. So I've lived all over the place. I grew up a military kid. Mom and dad loved the Lord. Uh, and um, I, I made a profession of faith and, and committed my life to Christ when I was about 12 years old. And, um, you know, began walking with him at that point, knew pretty quickly within about a year or so that that uh, I felt like the Lord wanted me to serve in some sort of vocational ministry. And so did an undergrad in theology at a little Bible college in North Florida, and then did my Master's of Divinity at Midwestern Seminary in Kansas City. Um, and between all of that, started pastoring. My wife and I served for a little while as missionaries in West Africa, where we were church planters. And uh, since then, for most of the last 20 years, I've been a pastor at three churches, everything from a very small little uh, church that had 33 people my first Sunday out in the country. Uh, near the Kansas border in, in Missouri, from that all the way to um, a megachurch, a, a sort of urban suburban megachurch of, of a, you know, a few thousand, a couple thousand in, um, in the Chattanooga, Tennessee area. Uh, aside from that, I did serve for a few years at Lifeway Christian Resources in Nashville. Um, I served on a team there. And now I work for two organizations that are sister organizations based out of the Dallas, Fort Worth and Washington, D.C. area, Glocal Net and... Um, and the Multi-Faith Neighbors Network, but I think we're going to get a little more into that here in just a few minutes. So uh, I, I guess I should say I'm also working on a PhD right now, trying to finish up my dissertation on uh, a PhD in missiology, which is the study of mission. Wow. That uh, just, we could have a whole podcast on moving 37 times. So um, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, let me, um, let me kind of go here for a second, just because we're going to go into more of what you're doing right now. Um, I sense, um, not just in the church, but outside the church, you know, there's this tension of, you know, should we support, you know, something that's global, like building wells or poverty in other countries versus like, you know, we live in cities and townships where there's poverty and there's pain and there's hurt. And I, again, I don't think it's uniquely Christian. I, I think you know, depending on who you meet, you know, depending on where their heart is, you're someone that, I mean, I'm assuming that you've managed that tension. How does that look in your life when it comes to the problems of the world of kind of bringing people together and kind of serving them? Yeah, I think, uh, I think those are good questions. I think there's probably a, a couple of different ways to answer the question with respect to that tension. I, I think first, uh, just in a general sense, there is this idea that, uh, and it's a biblical ideal, you know, through those whom have been given much, much is required, much is expected. And so I think there's this idea that those of us who have greater resources, greater access to communication, transportation, um, that sort of thing, have an obligation, uh, a mm -hmm. sense of global responsibility. Uh, the idea of... Um, you know, the, the lines that draw around nation states is um, a cultural sociological phenomenon, but not necessarily a, a, a 
biblical phenomenon. Mm. Uh, we're going to eventually all be gathered together in a single kingdom, a city, the New Jerusalem, the Bible describes, uh, where we won't necessarily identify as North Americans or South Africans or whatever the case might be. Uh, rather, all of us, you know, identifying as residents of God's kingdom. And so um, I think there, we do have to be careful of some sort of implicit xenophobia, even racism that we may not even recognize uh, that can be present when we say, well, I'm just going to take care of my own, you know, my neighborhood, my community, that sort of thing. When there is, there are global needs and there's a global community and, and those of us who have been given much have some responsibility to the global community. Now, having said that, I do think there's also a sort of a more micro uh, answer to that question that we've got to be careful that what we're doing is not, um, is not actually detrimental as we try and assist and as we try and help one another. There's a great book by Brian Fickert, When Helping Hurts, uh, that I highly recommend that really kind of gets into this idea that we can be well-meaning and try and care for and and uh, be able to help other people. But in doing so, we can create dependency and sort of foster welfare state, that sort of thing. And so we've got to be careful with the application of how we do those things. But on a, a, a sort of a macro level, at a general level, yes, I do think we have a responsibility to those places that can often be far away from us um, that have need because we have, we've been blessed with so much, um, you know, we've been blessed tremendously and it's just not that expensive or difficult for us to get somewhere. I, I'm going to be heading to um, the Middle East here in a, in a few weeks and I was looking at tickets yesterday and I mean, I could right now round trip from my little airport in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I can be there for a week for nine hundred dollars. Mm. I mean, nine hundred dollars, not chump change, but that's not that expensive for me to pack up and go halfway around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think there is a sense that we have a biblical obligation, a biblical responsibility to the world. Um, that doesn't mean we should neglect what's happening in our own community. We do have an obligation or responsibility to our own community, but I don't think it has to be an either or proposition. I think it can be a both and. Mm, okay. I think that that sets us up well to this question, you know, why should Christians have friends of other faith traditions? Um, I recently saw Dan White, who's an author, I believe it was him. Somebody will correct me by listening to the podcast, but he said, um, when conservatives get together with people that they disagree with, it can feel like compromise. And then when progressives or liberals get together, it can feel like complicity. And so I, I guess, I don't, first of all, I want to hear if you agree with that. But then secondly, you know, just in the work that you're doing, like to even sit at the table, there seems to be just a ton of misconceptions that we, we can't even just sit and have a cup of coffee without some sort of that. So as you think about the misconceptions of having friends from other faith, as you think about even the problem of conservatism, is it compromise? And then with progressives, is it complicit? You know, how do you, how does that work? How do you structure? How do you frame that conversation? Yeah. And so let me, let me just sort of back up just a little bit and just say with the multi-faith neighbors network, the work we do, the fundamental, the core of the work we do is to help people of different faiths become authentic friends with one another, legitimately mm -hmm. authentic friendships uh, with one another. And, and so I do spend uh, the majority of my time probably with non-Christians and uh, with people who are not, not, um, who don't profess to be followers of Jesus or, or Christians in the way we would understand it. And, um, and I spend a lot of time working to help particularly people like myself, evangelical Christians, um, engage, reach across the aisle. And evangelicals have historically been absent from this space because of what you just identified. So to your first question, um, is it accurate to say that conservatives can feel like engaging with people who are different than them can feel like that's compromise and those on the progressive side of the fence can feel like it's com being complicit? Yes, I think that's an accurate statement if we assume that the emphasis is on how it feels, mm. not actually what it is, if that mm. makes sense, right? Um, and, and our feelings can betray us. So yes, conservative evangelicals have historically not been in this space because they're afraid that to do so would mean that they would have to compromise their faith. And frankly, Peter, if we can be honest, that's often happened mm -hmm. in this space. You know, let's all gather together and let's just sort of believe that we all believe fundamentally the same thing. And, you know, in, in sort of a, an overblown way of saying it, we all will hold hands and sing Kumbaya and, and everything's going to be happy and, and it's going to be good. And, you know, that's not what we're trying to accomplish. We like to say 
uh, and I say we, I'm talking about the multi-faith neighbors network that I help lead. Uh, we like to say that we come together from very different places. In fact, we come together from often irreconcilable differences, from places of irreconcilable difference. I've got friends who are Muslim or Jewish, um, and we have profound irreconcilable theological differences. I'm an evangelical Christian. I, you know, I believe in the exclusivity of Jesus. I want to see people come to faith in Christ. I, I desire all of those things. Um, and I don't have to sacrifice those things to engage with people who disagree with me. What I do have to do is be honest about those things. And, and when we're honest about those things and we don't try and pretend that we have some sort of other agenda in mind, um, then we can have genuine, authentic conversations. And I tell people all the time, I, of course, I want you to come to, to follow Jesus. I want you to be a Christian. I believe in this. I mean, it's, but, but if you don't, I'm still going to love you. If you don't, I believe you have inherent worth, value, and dignity. Because as a Christian, I, I would affirm there, that they're created in the image of God. And we can get into that here in just a minute, sort of the theological justification for, for why I would propose that we do this. But, uh, and then on the complicit, uh, on, the, on the side of being complicit, that's absolutely a concern for some progressives. Um, though I will tell you that seems to be less of a concern in the experience that I've had with more progressives than conservatives who are scared they're going to compromise when they're in the space. But it, but it is an issue. I, I can think of a particular person I was dealing with earlier today who that is a concern for them, that they're going to be complicit in what they believe to be inappropriate activity um, because they're engaging with conservatives. But ultimately, if we desire, um, if we desire to have communities that are peaceful, and if we desire to build resilient communities where we can live with one another in the midst of our differences, we're going to have to learn that loving and being in relationship with people does not mean you have to agree with them so that, that we don't have to compromise. And it doesn't mean you have to affirm everything that they do say or believe. So it doesn't mean you're going to be complicit by engaging with them. And those mm -hmm. things are very important. Let, let's dig into, you know, the, the neighborhood organization, the multi-faith neighborhood network that you're a part of, because what you just said there, like we could probably stop the podcast and like people are kind of, their heads are exploding. So, you know, the first place where I want to go is when you sit down with your friends, you know, that are Jewish and Muslim and you're having these conversations, I think what I hear you saying is, hey, they know where I'm at. They know I think Jesus is the only way. They also know I'm not trying to convert them. I'd love to have them come to church with me. I mean, what do you talk about? What do you do if I was to hang out with you? Because I, I think that that's might be where our listeners might be just kind of shocked and surprised. I mean, I talk about the same sort of things that I talk about when I'm sitting down with people at the football game on Friday night at my son's high school football games. We talk about their kids. We talk about, you know, the repairs they have to do on their house. But we also talk about theology. And, and this is, you know, this is an interesting point, Peter, and, and I think it's an important one. I like to sort of jokingly say, though, there, there's a lot of truth in this. The only people in, in the world that don't like to talk about religion or faith are white people in America or maybe white people in the West. Everybody else is interested in talking about faith, um, the Latino community, the African-American community, and globally, anywhere I go, talking about faith is not a difficult topic. Everybody likes to talk about it. And so for me, I mean, we do talk about those basic things. I mean, my friends who are Muslim or Jewish, they're my friends. I'm interested in their vacations that they go on and, you know, the challenges they're having with their teenage kids. And I talk about the sort of things that we're dealing with in our home. But then... This is a, a shift that I think evangelicals have got to come to. Instead of feeling the need to constantly tell others what we believe, start from the posture of a student asking others about what they believe. Mm. Um, it, it does a few things. It, it affirms their dignity, their worth, their value. It affirms your genuine interest in them as a person. And, um, when you, when you invite them to share with you, so like I, I'll have conversations with my Muslim friends and we'll talk about, different elements of Muslim theology, inevitably, they're going to ask me, well, how does a Christian understand this? Or how does a Christian think about that? And it's a great opportunity for me to share my faith. But as American Christians, we're not well conditioned to share our faith in an environment where our faith is on an equal level with other faith traditions. And I don't mean that they're all equal in terms of 
um, that I believe all of them are, are the same. I mean, I obviously, I've said this already. I'm going to say it again. I'm a Christian. I believe in the exclusivity of Jesus. So I, I really do believe this stuff. But I believe enough in the gospel. I believe in enough of the, in the beauty of the gospel and the power of the gospel that it doesn't scare me to put it on a level playing field with other faith traditions, to learn more about their faith and to share my faith and to trust that God's going to work in their lives and he's going to bring them to the point where he desires them to be. And, um, and so I, the, to me, have normal conversations like you would with a normal friend, but bring up the religious conversations, but don't try and just stand above them telling them what they should believe. Ask them to share with you what they believe. And maybe that leads into a, some sort of springboard conversation where you get to share with you with, with what, uh, share with them with, about what you believe, but, but show that you value them. Mm. So I, I want to kind of back up to your personal story. And I think, cause you mentioned you wanted to kind of go theologically there. And I, I think this is probably the best way to do it. You grew up in a military family and you became a missionary. And I'm sure some of my listeners are asking, how did Micah from a military family who has a certain perception of how the military operates end up, you know, becoming this missionary slash pastor? Um, you know, I think every organization that you've been a part of, there's probably some perception about that. Help people theologically understand how you landed where you landed and even why you operate the way you do, because I think there's some people who are like, is this guy real? Like, you know, he grew up in the South military guy. He loves to hang out with people of other faiths and he's an evangelical Christian. So maybe theologically would be the best way to help people understand how you got there. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a fantastic question. Let me do some, just some narrative um, background and then let me make sort of a little bit of a theological argument if I can first. Mm -hmm. So I did grow up a military kid and I grew up partially overseas um, and I grew up, you know, for instance, living in the Philippines. And when I lived in the Philippines, we didn't just live on base. We lived off base in a Filipino community and, um, you know, had Filipino friends and we attended a church that was off base as well. And it was, you know, full of Filipinos and, and Americans as, as well. And so, um, and then growing up in a military home, you know, when you do live on base, you live among a lot of folks who have very diverse worldviews. Mm. Um, it, it tends to be more diverse racially than often the communities that you live in, just that, that the average person may live in. Uh, I can remember when my dad retired from the Air Force and we moved to the Deep South for him to go to Bible college. He became a pastor. And uh, I remember hearing explicit racism and just being completely shocked. I was about 13 years old and I'd never heard anything like that before. So, um, I mean, it was, it blew me away. So first you have sort of an upbringing where I was raised in a global context and that helps for sure. But fast forward a number of years, my wife and I served overseas. We lived in a Muslim majority country, but we didn't know a lot of Muslims. We worked in a part of the country that wasn't very, that wasn't strongly Muslim. We did have a mosque in our, in our village, but it was predominantly animistic, uh, tribal religion sort of expression that we uh, lived around. And so we were familiar with it. And we moved over, by the way, we moved to West Africa about 10 or 12 days after 9-11 occurred. Wow. And so, I mean, it was in the height of that when we moved into this Muslim majority nation. And it was just, we came back to America that was very different. It changed without us uh, while we were gone. And it was very unsettling to come back to a very different place. But I was pastoring in Northwest Missouri. And um, there was a uh, a couple of mosques in town, but they were they were small. They met in a storefront. There was one in particular, the larger of the two mosques, that met in a storefront, and they had been saving up their money to build a facility. And they finally had enough money, and they built. They began building a facility, and it sat on a lot. And the building looked like you would think of as a mosque with a big dome. And it was uh, because of how it's, they orient it towards Mecca. It wasn't sitting squarely on the lot. It was kind of at an angle, and it was very noticeable. And you can imagine in a very uh, white, conservative, northwest Missouri town what the response was but from a lot of people. And, and I realized in my own church there was a lot of angst, you know, this, this fear that um, Muslim terrorists were going to be in, you know, present and that sort of thing. And so I remember calling who is now the man who is now my boss, Dr. Bob Roberts, who has done this better than just about anybody I know. And I said, Bob, what should I do? And Bob said, I want you to do three things. He said, I want you to buy a Quran and read it. Don't just assume what other people believe. Figure it out for yourself. 
He said, secondly, I want you to reach out to the imam, which is a Muslim version of like a, what we would think of as a pastor, sort of spiritual leader of the congregation. He said, I want you to read out, reach out to the local imam and go get coffee or, or go to share a meal with him. And third, he said, don't go buy a book by a white Christian guy about what Muslims believe. Learn from a Muslim themselves. Now, I am a white Christian guy who edited a book on how Christians can engage with Muslims. And Bob actually contributed a chapter to that book. So, you know, I'm not wholly opposed to those. But his point was learn from Muslims themselves. So that's what I did. And I was able to go to coffee with the local imam. But he said, I'll only come if I can bring someone with me. And I said, well, that's fine. I don't mind. And he brought this big bodybuilder former Irish Catholic from Boston who had converted to Islam. And it wasn't until afterwards that I realized he brought that guy as a bodyguard because he was scared of me. Mm. And I mean, that just was stunning to me. And I thought, wait a minute, no, 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 no. We're supposed to be scared of Muslims. They're not supposed to be scared of us. We're the followers of Jesus. I mean, this is the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitude. You know, this is Jesus teaching um, the, the story of the Good Samaritan. Like, I, I'm, I want to be friendly. I want to be kind. I'm not to be feared. But as I've grown to understand Muslims and, and even those in the Jewish community and get to know many of them, there is a huge fear in those communities toward white evangelicals in particular. And it's because we haven't treated them very well. There's a research project that came out in IS, from this organization called ISPU in 2015 that broke every person in America up by religious demography. So including even people who have no religious affiliation. And it found that the religious group with the smallest percentage of relationships with Muslims was evangelicals. Mm -hmm. Every other religious group has, has a higher percentage of relationships with Muslims than evangelicals. We're, we're the worst. And that's, you know, that data is terrifying to me. So that's anecdotally sort of my story. Uh, I, all of that kind of led me to this point where I thought we've got to do better. So then theologically, how have I worked this out? There's a, there's a number of principles, and I've actually got a document that you can share with um, your listeners, just a Christian theology of multi-faith that I wrote about a year, year and a half ago with Bob Roberts and another pastor, Dr. Steve Besner. But here are the principles that we sort of came down on. First, the image of God is present in every person. Mm -hmm. We believe that every person has dignity, worth, and value simply because they exist. It's not tied to what they do, say, or believe. Because they're created in the image of God, they have value. In God's eyes, they should have value in our eyes. Secondly, the Bible is very clear that we should have love for one another. In fact, the Bible says, by this, all will know, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The defining characteristic of a disciple of Jesus is to love those, uh, to love others. And in particular, the Bible says that this is not just theoretical love. We're commanded to love those who we might believe are our enemies. Mm. Uh, first, uh, Matthew literally speaks to that, says, if we don't have love, we have nothing, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. And so this is not just theoretical. We have to practically engage with people who are different than us. The third sort of tenet of, the, of our theology would be this idea of the kingdom of God, that God is ruling and reigning over all things, all places at all times. Um, there's a uh, an old theologian, Dutch theologian named Abraham Kuyper, who has this quote where he said, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. In other words, there's no sacred secular divide. Everything is under the authority of God. And therefore, everything we do in the world is to be a reflection of the kingdom. So the way I engage with people who disagree with me is to be a reflection of my residency in the kingdom of God. And that helps shape the way I think about engaging with those who disagree with me. The fourth tenet would be peaceable living. The Bible says, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Even those who may not want to live at peace with us, we have an obligation to pursue peace with them. We want to display Jesus. We want to be a visible manifestation of Jesus and the kingdom of God in the lives of those who may not follow him. Uh, just a couple more ideas. We want to advocate for the idea that religious freedom is for all people. This is a founding principle of the U.S. Uh, of the U.S. Uh, concept, the experiment that is the American democracy. And not only is it a founding principle of American democracy, but it was argued particularly and most stringently by evangelicals, particularly Baptist uh, at mm -hmm. the founding of America, were the ones who argued most adamantly for this idea of religious freedom for all. And there's this idea now that when we argue for religious freedom for all people, that we are embracing and endorsing views that we may not believe. And I disagree with that profoundly. What we're saying is that every person has to be accountable before God for, for, for what they do with him mm. and that they have to be able to make that decision with freedom without anything 
forcing that decision on them. It has to be a freely chosen decision. And we've got to make space for every person to freely choose um, what they believe about God. And, and the, the final two things I would say is this. There is a biblical principle that we are to work for the common good. Um, we see that in Jeremiah chapter 29, where, where God says to the exiles in in Babylon, seek the shalom of the city. Shalom is not just peace. It's the holistic blessing of God. We see it in Amos 5 when we're told we're to um, seek justice. Uh, in Romans 13, we're to seek good government. There's there's so many more in this document I'm going to send you. The last thing I would say is we want the opportunity to share our faith. Mm -hmm. um, and, and our faith is best shared in the context of relationships. And um, you can share good news outside of the context of relationships. But when I run around and I, you know, scream... You know, my wife's going to have a baby and somebody who doesn't know me, they'll be like, well, I mean, that's good. I'm glad for you, but they'll move on and never think anything about it. But to those who know me and love me, that's meaningful news. Good news is best shared in the context of relationship. And so we want to build relationships where we can share good news, news that's changed our lives. And, and so that would be the final sort of theological principle that we would use to argue for why Christians should engage in this. That... Um that's super helpful. Here's here's kind of the direction I want you to go cuz I want to go to today, but you know, I think you might have hinted at this a little bit. Um so I'm thinking about our friends that are dechurched and unchurched. I think it would be surprising to them that Christians before Constantine in whatever it was, 100 or something like that, Christianity when Jesus was walking was by far the minority. So even when you read the Bible, you're reading it, um, you know, from a Christian majority culture, so to speak, however you want to define that. So help our listeners kind of understand, because what you just said biblically really fits into what it was like in the early church to kind of see where these values and principles, because I think Paul would kind of walk around, you know, who wrote the majority of the New Testament and sit there and be like, you know, this is majority, like it would just be odd to him. So, I mean, help our listeners mm -hmm. understand that. <laughs> yeah, I would say historically, first of all, the things that kill Christian advance uh, or gospel advance historically, I think most of us would think, oh, persecution would, would kill gospel advance. That's not true. The things that have killed gospel advance or Christian advance are power and wealth historically. When the church gets wealthy, when the church gets powerful, it impedes um, the organic progress of the gospel and the, the organic growth of the church. Uh, persecution actually often fosters the growth of the church. Tertullian, who was a lawyer in the third century, one of the early fathers of the church, he, he has this phenomenal quote that's been remembered throughout history when he said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. In other words, Christianity is sort of odd in that way, that the more it seems to be persecuted, the more it flourishes. So we're living in a very unique and peculiar time in, in global history. You're right about that, where America is not is not and never has been a majority Christian nation in the sense that a majority of our people have made professions of faith to believe in Jesus Christ as their savior, but is absolutely a context where Christianity is the assumed dominant religious expression. Mm. And that's true of both people who are practicing it and sort of this cultural expression of Christianity. And so these other faiths like Islam and Judaism and Buddhism and Hinduism and th those sort of things are all minority faiths in our, in our context. When you look at the historical context of how Christianity flourishes, um, and then look at the Bible, we have our greatest opportunities when we are a prophetic minority in the context. So there's all these Christians right now who see, look, the American church is, Christians in America are not being persecuted. I know there's lots of Christians who want to talk about sort of the persecution of the church. That's not true. It is being marginalized to some degree, right? So dominant Christian thought is being sort of pushed off to the side at some, at some levels, and, and that's frightening to people. And so there's this great fear that there's a bad future coming for the church. I, I don't think that's true. I think we may be at our best in the future, um, but, but we're at our best when we are a counterculture to the culture at large, when we can say this, you see what's happening in the culture at large? That's not the way it's to be in the kingdom of God. We're going to function as this little outpost of the kingdom of God. And by the way, I think that's what churches are. Every church is an outpost of the kingdom of God. This is a visible display, a visible manifestation of the kingdom of God in this particular context where it's placed. And so, you know, in the first century, when Paul was 
um, was was writing and, and Jesus was walking the earth and Jesus said, let the little children come unto me. That was countercultural in a context where often children were marginalized and dismissed as having no value or mm. even in more pagan culture where infanticide was regularly practiced. Uh, to make sure that you would only get the children you wanted. You know, you would practice the infanticide if it wasn't the gender you wanted or or that sort of thing. Christianity was countercultural, saying, no, 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 children have value, inherent value, dignity, and worth. Women who were dismissed and marginalized and minimized in their culture, Jesus lifted them up and said, no, 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 these women are my disciples and they're, you know, they're prominent followers of Jesus. And so I think that's what we have the opportunity to do. And I think, talk about the unchurched, dechurched. I think many of them would be surprised to hear of, conservative evangelicals who believe in the exclusivity of Jesus who say, I want to love people who are not like me. Mm. And I want them to believe in what I believe in. But even if they don't, I'm still going to love them because so many unchurched and dechurched people, particularly dechurched people, are there because they've been hurt by the church failing to be loving. And I'm not saying the church shouldn't have standards. Again, I'm an exclusivist. I believe in the exclusivity of Jesus, but I can believe in that while also being kind and disagreeing with grace with mm. those who are different than I am. Mm. Wow, you're not passionate about that at all, are you? Uh, <laughs> that's great. Well, let me let me kind of come back to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, yeah. you, you have three kids. Uh, your son, uh, I, I've been following, plays baseball and football. Um, and, you know, just what it seems like, so from following you on social media since you were a pastor versus now, I not much again on my vantage point has changed, but let me just get personal. And I just kind of want to hear. So one of the things that I appreciated about the shutdown was I felt like church became really simple. Like it was, Mm -hmm. Hey, we're going to do small groups. Well, we want you to come to, you know, we want you to come on Sunday morning, live streaming. And now like uh, just being transparent as a pastor, I'm in this weird spot where it's like, Hey, we need to do some gatherings to help people feel connected. And my struggle with that is I want people to have time and margin in their schedule just to get to know their neighbors. Cause I'm guessing yeah. like, why should Christians have friends of other faiths? Like if you're at church six times a week, that means you're not in your neighborhood. You're not playing sports. You're not going to your kids games and stuff like that. So number one, I, I guess I want to kind of hear your kind of, I wouldn't say tension, but kind of your, just how your schedule has changed from a pastor to now a leader of two organizations. But then also like, I I think people are making this rocket science, but like, I mean, you go to football games, like you hang out with it. Like, I don't think it's as hard. So first of all, deal with the transition from pastor to where you are now and kind of deal with the church. And then secondly, what does it look like now? Yeah, so those are good questions. I would say first, the transition. I, you know, I'm a layperson now in a church. I'm a church member. I sit in the back, by the way, every Sunday. I sit towards the back of the room. It's the first time in my life that I've sat in the back of the room. Also, just about the first time in my life that my wife and kids and I have gone to church together, which has been very new because normally I would get up and be there early on Sunday morning. Uh, the last church I pastored, we would have, you know, I'd, I'd be in three services every Sunday morning. And so my kids and my wife might be in different services. We never sat together. So first of all, that's awesome. And I love, I'm a part of a great church with a pastor who we love and uh, we're thankful for. And, and I love just being able to serve. My wife and I are kind of on the baptism team. So we get to interview the baptismal candidates and I set up, we have a portable baptistry at our church. So I set it up whenever we have baptism and I love being able to do those things. And we lead a small group in our home, which we've done for a long time, even when we were a pastor, but uh, it, it's been fun for me to be able to do those things and not have this thing hanging over my head that, oh, you're just doing this because you're paid to do this. Mm. No, I mean, I was just, I love to do this. I like being able to serve the church. I love to be able to serve my neighbors. I like to be able to open up our home and have people in our home every, I mean, we had this, we have our small group, it's getting really big and we're, we're just about to be sized out of our, our house, I'm afraid. And there was a lady who visited for the first time this past Sunday And she said to my wife, she said, I don't know how you do this every week. I would hate having all these people in my house every week. But God's given my wife the gift of hospitality and she adores it. And we love having people. And so, you know, the transition for me has been in some ways uh, a little challenging. I mean, there's some identity questions that sort of get wrapped up. I've been mostly a pastor for the last 20 years and I'm not a a pastor right now. And so there's, you know, I've had to wade through those, but I'll tell you, I love being a member of a church, serving, engaging in my community. And we, 
are a part of a church who doesn't program a whole lot. I mean, we have very, we have minimal programming and we do what, what programming we do have is generally in the community with other people. And so I love that. And so, um, you know, but even back when I was a pastor, I would coach soccer for little kids uh, when my kids were, were young and playing soccer. And I did that on purpose because if I didn't, I was never engaged in the community. Like I could spend all my time at the church talking to church people and uh, the church I pastored in Missouri, uh, the second church I pastored in Missouri, my last Sunday there was one of my favorite Sundays because I got to baptize one of my, one of my kids who played on my soccer team. I got to baptize her dad. And he turned around and then baptized his daughter who played on my soccer team. Both of them came to know Jesus and we'd been friends with them for a few years. We're still friends with them now. But that was the, you know, that was the point. I wanted to be able to engage with people who were outside of our church community, outside of the Christian community, and just be able to help, you know, display and, and, and share Jesus with people who were, who were not part of our normal orbit. Now, having said that, you, you, you said the perfect thing a minute ago, Peter, when you said this is not rocket science. <laughs> People think I've got to know what Muslims believe. I've got to know what those in the Jewish community believe. I've got to understand their holidays or, you know, you get the big theological questions, Trinity, the, the question of the Trinity, which is an issue among the Muslim community and the deity of Jesus and, you know, those sort of things. You don't need to know any of those things. I mean, it's helpful if you want to study and understand it. It's very helpful, but you don't need to know those things. What you need to do is know how to be a good friend. And I don't know of anybody who's bad at being a friend. And I don't know anybody who's bad at sharing good news. I tell people this all the time. Everybody's a good evangelist because evangelism literally means good news, right? Sharing good news. I'm a Kansas City Royals fan, which means I'm something of a masochist. My team is almost never good. <laughs> We've been bad for a long time. But we won the World Series in 2015. And we went to the World Series in 2014 and 15. And I got to go to the World Series in 2015, one of the games we won over the Mets. I'm sure you've got some Mets fans in your church since you guys are in New York. Oh, yeah. um, but we, we beat the Mets in 2015. I, I was so loud and obnoxious about it, telling everybody we won the World Series, posting pictures and videos because it was good news. And it's just normal for me to share good news. You know, you get pregnant. It's just a piece of cake. Some somebody gets engaged and it's not hard for them to figure out how to tell people that. Jesus ought to be the same way. We've, we've made it way too difficult. Man, I've got to know this outline and I've got to have all these Bible verses memorized. Man, all you got to do is tell somebody what happened to you. It, it's just like any other piece of good news that you have. It's a normal, natural thing that we're all good at sharing. And the thing I think that is particularly important to your rocket science concept, con concept the most beneficial thing you can do to engage with people of other faiths is to share a meal. It's the single best thing you can do Open up your home to them if you can, or if that's frightening to them or to you, go to a restaurant and buy their meal and, you know, talk to them about it ahead of time so you can figure out if there's dietary restrictions, you know, halal for Muslims and, and kosher for, for those who are Jewish and, you know, other faith traditions have their dietary restrictions. So talk to them a little bit about it. I mean, you might want to figure that out, but it's not that difficult. And if you can sit down and show hospitality, and particularly these three faiths that I've been talking about, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are all three, we call them Abrahamic traditions, Abrahamic faith traditions. They all three have hospitality at their heart. If you can express hospitality to someone of a different faith, I promise you they're going to feel um, loved, affirmed, and they're going to desire to want to extend it back to you. Don't make this too hard. Be hospitable, ask questions, and let the conversation just develop from there. You know, going back to the whole rocket science thing, um, just how I live this expression out. So, you know, I, I have a group of guys that every once in a while, they're kind of of different faith, you know, backgrounds and stories. They just come hang out in my back porch. Um, we have a, a friend here at the church. He owns a, um, he owns a restaurant brewery called Knucklehead. So like, you know, I always want to introduce Len from Knucklehead, you know, he comes to Browncroft <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say that on the podcast, but we're going to keep it in anyways. It's Len. So <laughs> anyways, uh, like I, I, I guess, so you mentioned that your wife has the gift of hospitality and what, mm -hmm. what I can kind of hear, cause my wife and I go through this challenge my house isn't clean enough. I don't know how to cook. And, but I, I know this, like when I, and, and we managed it really well. And I have two daughters that are under four years old. So we're in a little bit of an odd season of life. So I guess for our friends that are like resistant to that, I think you're kind of painting a picture of what they're missing out of. But I mean, just give them some practical tips of what this looks like. Like what, you're not having a Thanksgiving dinner with them. Like, I don't know, just what have you been training and teaching people? 
Yeah. So again, I would say the most important thing you can do is show hospitality. So if your house is not clean, if you don't cook, go to a restaurant together. Mm -hmm. you know, find a Mediterranean restaurant, find a Middle Eastern restaurant where there's a good chance it's going to be halal uh, or, or uh, potentially even kosher, depending on the restaurant. So start there. Just express hospitality, show hospitality. Now, you said, you know, you're not going to be sharing a Thanksgiving meal together. Let me let me do put this plug in. So when we lived in Nashville, we had some friends who were refugees from Iraq. They were Muslim refugees from Iraq and they were fairly new to the U.S. and they were trying to learn U.S. you know, experiences. And and uh, we had Easter we had Easter dinner at our house. We were already having Easter dinner at our house. We already had family coming over. And we just said, uh, Safe and Sarah, we said, why don't you all come and enjoy uh, Easter dinner with us? We ended up doing Thanksgiving dinner the same way. We're already doing this meal. We're already going to have family and friends coming over. It's all, Our house is already going to be ready. And they wanted to experience an American custom and an American tradition. And so we got to come in. And then, of course, we're going to explain when it, when it comes to Easter. Let me tell you about why, as Christians, we celebrate Easter. Mm. We celebrate because it's the time when Jesus resurrected from the dead. And so this, for us, is a very important holiday. Um, I'm not trying to force them to, um, you can't come to my house if you don't believe this. I'm, I'm just saying, hey, this is, as a follower of Jesus, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, I believe my whole faith hangs on this. And Easter is that time every year when we celebrate this together. The other thing I would say is um, if you reach out and begin to develop relationships with people in the Muslim or Jewish community, they're going to invite you to their special uh, times. They're going to invite you to break fast during Ramadan. Uh, they'll call this, they'll, they'll say, we're going to have an iftar dinner. Uh, these are often large, elaborate dinners that might happen at the mosque. And uh, they're, they're, it's not a, if, uh, Christians are often scared. Well, if I go to the mosque, am I going to have to participate in Muslim worship or Muslim prayer or something like that? No, it's it's just a meal where you get to sit down and get to know people of a different faith. Or or if you're uh, if you are um, you know friends with folks in the Jewish community, there might be a Passover seder that they want to invite you to come and be a part of. And I promise you, they'll, they'll invite you to, to be a part of that. Take advantage of those opportunities. I, I'll be honest. I've also, um, and this is not something I've done. Rarely, I mean, I've done this fairly often. I'll go to the Friday service at the local mosque once I've begun to build some relationships with there. They, so Muslims uh, gather for their big day of prayer. Uh, they they pray five times a day every day during the week. But Friday, the midday prayer, it's called the Jummah prayer, is kind of the emphasis when most people who do go to the mosque or the masjid, that's where they go. So I've, I've asked, can I come? Sure, we would love to have you come. I don't participate because I'm a Christian. So I'm not saying that we're all worshiping the same way. I'll sit in the back of the room and just observe. And, I'll, and I want to show them that I respect them and that I'm interested and I want to learn more about them. I've gone to Sabbath services on a Friday, e on a, sa a fri Friday, or Saturday evening, sorry, with the Jewish community um, and go to their Shabbat services at the synagogue. You can do this and not have to engage, not have to feel like you have to compromise your faith to do so, but you can do this as a guest to show that you care about them and that you're interested in learning more about them. All of these are easy things to do. Become a pen pal with someone. Just, hey, can I write you back and forth and ask some questions? Don't overcomplicate this stuff. And my guess is most of the people listening to this run into people of other faiths, at least with some regularity, at their kid's mm -hmm. school at the grocery store. It's not hard to to strike up a conversation with someone. Often they're going to be fearful, particularly Muslims. If they see you as a white Christian person, they might be scared. What do they want? Do they want to hurt me or do they want me to get away from here? Do they want me out of their community. So if you can, you know, calm those fears quickly. Hey, I just, I'm really interested. I'd like to learn more. I'm glad you're here. I would really like the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. I'm just telling you nine times out of 10, they're going to be very excited about that opportunity. So let's let's go even simpler than that, because I, I think you hit on a good point, which is, you know, how do I even start a conversation? Now, I'm a natural extrovert. You got an email from me. You're like, who's this Peter sure. guy? You know, um, you know, so yeah. <laughs> just just to kind of show my cards, you know, I, I learned from, you know, a mentor and a friend. Like the question I ask people is, hey, um, you know, tell me about where you grew up. Like that seems to be a very safe question. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, here in Rochester, New York, we have this, uh, grocery store uh, called Wegmans. It's kind of like everybody's kind of, so whenever I, I meet someone that's, you know, doing my checkout at Wegmans, you know, I always ask them, you know, did you grow up in the Rochester area? You know, and that's specific, you know, just, or where are you from? And inevitably, you know, it might be someone like you, Hey, I was, you know, I grew up in the military. I was all over. It, like, it just opens up a door to talk with people. That's kind of my 
little tip to start in conversation. What do you do to start conversations with people that might be apprehensive or scared or just you want to get to know other people? You're apprehensive and anxious. Yeah, so th you've just hit on the best answer, particularly if um, if they're, you know, if it's clear they have an accent or something. And so, you, you know, hey, they're not from the U.S. They're 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 originally from somewhere else. Hey, can you tell me where you're from? And I've traveled a lot in the world, so it's not unusual for them to tell me where they're from and I've been there or I've been somewhere close to there. So for me, it's just easy to say, Hey, I've been there before. I know a little something about that or, you know, that sort of thing. But if you've not, that's okay. Just start. Hey, can you tell me a little bit about where you're from? I'm curious. I'd love to know more about it. Ask them some questions. People love, there's something inherent about all of us that we love to share our stories with people. We love to share about ourselves with people. Uh, now that's assuming that they believe you're, you're safe, that you don't want to harm them, that you're not trying to, you know, find a way to be rude to them because you'll be amazed. Maybe you won't be amazed at how many people, particularly Muslims who are visibly different sometimes. So the women are wearing um, a hijab or, you know, uh, something like that, how they've, people have been rude to them in the mm. grocery store, you know, speak English or, you know, that sort of thing. If they overhear him saying something in a different language. So if you can help, help them to see, I'm not a threat and ask them, Hey, where are you from? Or, or if you're, you know, if you're interacting with them at the school, hey, tell me about your kids. What are your kids' names? Th these are not difficult. What are the things that you would say if you saw someone who looked and sounded like you, mm. but you don't know them? What are the sort of introductory questions you would ask them? Tell me about your kids or, hey, do you guys live around here? Or, um, you know, where'd you get that shirt? I really like that. These are all simple questions. You don't have to overthink this. Again, you don't need to be trained. You don't need, you know, you don't have to. I mean, it helps to have all those things, but you don't have to. What are the natural things you would say to someone that you would, you know, be curious about knowing? And, and I would say if you're an introvert, and I'm like you, I'm an extrovert. I don't mind opening my mouth and speaking to someone, Peter. So there are introverts among us who would find that a little bit more difficult. I'd say go on social media. Hmm. Uh, find someone, it, maybe it's Facebook or it's nextdoor.com or something like that, um, you know, that are context specific to your community where you can find people from your community, a Facebook group or something like that. Find someone who's clearly Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu and just send them a private message. Say, hey, I was, I live in the community. I noticed that you're Muslim or I noticed that you're Hindu and I would really like to learn more. If you're an introvert, that's an easy way to do it. You don't even have to look at them. You're just writing them a little private message and let that open the door to have a little bit of a dialogue and a conversation that ultimately could end in, you know, could end up with you meeting face to face at Starbucks or something like that, or, uh, or the place that you just mentioned, I've already forgotten the name of it, but the place from the member of your, of Browncroft that, you know, that they own where you could sit down at some point after you've broken the ice and have a conversation. Don't overthink it, y'all. Please. Uh, sorry, y'all. My Southern is slipping in there. But uh, don't overthink it, you guys. Well, Just, no, it's, no. it's not that difficult. And I, I think that that's so important. And I, I think it's worth kind of looking at our schedule. And again, you know, we're a podcast that there's probably people that have been in church for 80 years. And there's people that, like, they're on the fringes of leaving church. But what you're saying is the gospel actually, you know, it motivates us to get involved in the community. And again, just like, again, not overthinking it. Uh, I go to the same Starbucks on Sunday morning every week. You know, I know every barista by name. I'm intentional. Like there's, you know, two Starbucks near me. You know, I, I know them. I've heard their story. And, you know, even for the introvert, I'd say like, what restaurant do you go to every week? You know, and there's probably more restaurants. My my wife, one of the things I love about her, she's really frugal. So we probably don't go out to eat as much as I'd like. And that's a good thing on another hand. But on the same <laughs> token, um, like, I don't think that we're, whether you're following Jesus or skeptical of Jesus, just making yourself available and kind of committing to, to different locations, it just gives you that different perspective. You know, as a pastor, you know, kind of like what you said about uh, coaching the the soccer team, you know, I have to be very intentional about remembering, like, you know, not everybody is debating Calvinism and Arminianism, like, or, you know, the <laughs> Trinity, like they're dealing with anxiety, the future, you know, what are schools going to be like? And, you know, part of following Jesus is kind of living with that awareness. I think one of my favorite things is, you know, I love when people have the the eyes and the ears of I'm taking my friend to church for the first time because all of a sudden it just clicks like 
oh, what is the pastor preaching on? Like, what's the worship music going to be like? And I think you're kind of articulating an intentionality to whether you follow Jesus or not of putting yourself in a place that you're getting to know people who are outside your circle. Yeah. And I, I think this is a biblical concept, right? So consider again, Jer- Jeremiah chapter 29, such a massively important passage to understand when you think about this sort of thing. In Jeremiah tw- ch- uh, chapter 29, the Israelites had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon. And so they're living now as this exiled minority, enslaved minority in Babylon. And there's so many important things to note about that. First, chronology, timeline. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is Daniel the prophet. Mm -hmm. So this is the same timeline as as those folks. Secondly, Babylon was not a nice Christian place. Babylon was, you know, it was a horrific context with awful leaders who were very much ungodly, did horrible things to people. And what did, and, and, and history tells us that There were false prophets among the Israelites saying, you're only going to be here in captivity for two years, and then you're going to go back to Jerusalem. And so there was this thing happening where sort of the Israelites were sectioning themselves off from larger Babylonian community, and they were Mm -hmm. just sort of hiding out with their community. If we can just hide out with the rest of the Israelites, we don't have to deal with those awful Babylonians. And in Jeremiah 29, beginning in verse 4, the prophet Jeremiah, or God through the prophet Jeremiah, says, Make this your home. He says, build houses, plant gardens, live off the produce, get get married, find mm-hmm. husbands and wives and get married. And then he says, and give your children, have children and then give their give your children in marriage. And he paints this picture that they're going to be there a while. In fact, he goes on to say 70 years are going to pass and then I'm going to return and take you back to your homeland, which, by the way, to the adult audience that was listening to this meant Almost all of them were going to die in captivity. They were never going to see Jerusalem again. Babylon Mm. was their new home. And and God's word to them was, make Babylon your home. Embed yourself there. Plant gardens. Build houses. Get married. Have relationships with people. And I would say that's the same thing we need to do. We've we've so segmented the Christian experience that we have our friends and we have our, you know, our engagement, whether it's soccer or baseball or football or what, you know, our civic enterprises. And then we have church and we go to our church on Sunday and maybe we go to a Bible study on Tuesday and then we go to church on Wednesday night or whatever the case might be. But, but they're also so sort of segmented from one another. And instead, what I think Jeremiah teaches is that we are children of God, residents of the kingdom of God who are living out that expression at all times and all places with all people intentionally purposeful living at everywhere we go, recognizing that we are the visible manifestation of the kingdom of God everywhere we go. When people Mm. see us, they ought to be able to say, that's what the kingdom of God looks like. You know, why do we advocate for racial reconciliation? Not because it's the cool hip thing to do, but because in the kingdom of God, um, the Bible, it doesn't say that the races will cease to exist. In fact, it says around the throne, there will be people from every nation, tribe, tongue, and race. But it says that they're all equal in the kingdom of God, that all races and, and ethnicities are equal in the kingdom of God. And so we have a theological argument for why we pursue this. Why do we care for orphans? Because the Bible says in James that pure and undefiled religion before God is this, that those who look after orphans and widows in their distress, we don't just do it because it's a cool thing to do. We do it because this is what it's going to look like in the kingdom of God. And so you and I are visible pictures of the kingdom of God everywhere we go and at all places. And so we live with intentionality, with purpose as visible manifestations of the kingdom uh, as we engage with our communities, our neighbors around us. So, you know, too often we go to church, we do that on purpose, and then we just sort of live this life, whatever come what come, whatever may. And instead we need to be living with intentionality and purpose at all times and in all places. Wow. Uh, these 50 minutes went by really fast. This is super engaging. We're going to, Micah, we're going to have to have you on again. So the, the question that we always close with is what does Jesus have to say? And I, I did it cause you kind of led right into it in a beautiful way. So th- the good news is you're a professor, you're a writer, uh, you've been a pastor. So whatever mess I leave to that question, you can clean up. Does that sound good? That's great. So, um, you know, if you've been listening to this podcast, you know, what does Jesus have to say about why we should have friends of uh, other faiths? Uh, it, it's pretty clear from what, you know, Micah said, but I, I think where I want to kind of go with this is, you know, there's a number of verses just about hospitality and treating people. And I might, I might be going a little bit off the interpretation, but you know, when Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about if a Roman soldier 
you know, uh, takes your cloak, give them another cloak or walk the, or I walk the second mile or again, I'm botching this up cause I'm thinking on the fly what I've been thinking about. But even in Hebrews, it talks about, you know, entertaining and having hospitality cause you don't know if you have angels in front of you. And I just think that we want to do big things for God and whether you're de-churched or unchurched or skeptical, like we want to do big things like build wells in Africa or, you know, erase poverty or things like that. And I wonder if the bigger differences in those verse kind of point out is Jesus says, Hey, start really small and watch what I do. You know, watch what you do when you go the extra mile, watch what you do when you have someone over, because again, kind of the, the major point, Micah, that you're bringing up that I totally believe. And I think every Christian would believe is when you give people your time, when you give them your attention, you're listening, you're communicating to that individual. I believe that you're created in God's image and I want you to feel and know that. And that's kind of the calling for us as Christians is to start there. So that's what I think Jesus would say. And he modeled that too. Yeah. And if I could just piggyback a little bit on the, on the backside of that, I there's nothing to clean up. That was fantastic. But I would just piggyback a little bit more and say, Jesus was known in the community as a friend of sinners. That was his designation. In other words, he was a friend of those who didn't believe like him. He was a friend of those who didn't embrace his, his faith. Uh, I wonder how many of us are known that way. And the mm -hmm. other piece of that I would say is we often, it's interesting to me to hear people say, well, Jesus got angry and he yelled at, you know, he called people, uh, he used strong language with people and he flipped tables over and he, you know, pulled out a whip. All of that's true. But remember this, Jesus used that on people in his own religious family who were misusing the faith for their own gain. Mm. And when he saw people uh, who didn't believe like he did, like Zacchaeus, he said, come on down, I'm going to your house for dinner today. And mm. so I think there's this picture from Jesus that we're a friend to those who don't believe like we do. We're kind, we're gracious. Those who claim to believe like we do, who use the faith, who manhandle the faith for their own personal gain, we ought to hold them to account. But when it comes to those who don't believe like we do, who disagree with us, but are outside of our faith, I think our responsibility is to be their friend. Mm. What a place to close. Micah, what, what's the best place for our listeners to follow you or get a hold of you? Yeah, so um, you, you can check out our organizational websites, glocal.net, that's G-L-O-C-A-L.net, or M-F-N-N.org, Multifaith Neighbors Network. You can also check out my personal website, micafreeze.com. That's Micah, like the minor prophet, M-I-C-A-H. Freeze is spelled like fries, F-R-I-E-S, like French fries. So it's micafreeze.com. And then I'm just Micah Freeze on social media. So Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I'm not on Snapchat or TikTok. I can't figure those out. I'm too old for that. But I'm on the other things. If, if you want to connect with me there, it's, it's a great way to connect. Well, I, I'm sure your kids will probably, you know, set you up for that later. Who knows? But anyways. <laughs> They've got it figured out. The the best place to find us is whygodwhypodcast.com. You can click uh, the subscribe button. You'll get this episode and all of our other episodes emailed to you each week on Thursday. Micah, thanks so much for joining us. We hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.